Absolutely. So you, your organization covers a variety of different issues, and I'm wondering, uh, from your perspective, what how you would prioritize those with respect to the risk for the average uh, person in the United States, and and uh, I think maybe that priority would be helpful, and then we could talk about the specifics. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know one of the things that we've worked on again because it, it, it is such a um, it's such an empowering issue, and it's one that you know that that takes you to almost every other issue, and is so important is the issue of food, um, and you know food is the most in- intimate relationship, along with obviously breathing and, and drinking, that we have with the environment. I'm always amused when people say I'm not interested in food issues; I'm interested in environmental issues. <laughs> I would say, whoa, let's sit down for a sec talk about that, you know, because again, you know, we, there is no more intimate relationship that we have with the environment than, you know, than what we eat, you know, and, um, uh, it, it, you know, to me, it is a great uh, moment for everybody out there to say, you know, by making, I, I, I'm making a choice every day, a choice that I can control to a great extent of what I eat, what my family eats, and to a certain extent with people around me eat. Uh, and, uh, that is to me a, a really, really important moment because in that moment you can reflect your views on social justice, your views on animal welfare, your views on the environment, on, on uh, protecting our waters, protecting our air, protecting our soil, protecting our farm communities, and protecting our community health. All of that is based in that decision that we all make several times a day. And, you know, um, uh, though Ralph Nader is a very good friend of mine and, and, and mentor of, of many years, I do not like the word consumer. Uh, I rarely use it, or uh, if ever. Uh, and that's because consumer comes from this idea like a fire consumes. Mm-hmm. Uh, they used to talk about tuberculosis as consumption, as consuming the bodies of its victims. They got all thin and died. I mean, what a terrible way to think of ourselves, you know, as consumers, as as people who consume. I think that no matter, and I'm not always on top of this mountain, but we need to think of ourselves not as consumers, but as creators. Every decision we make, for example, and this is just in the food area, of course, it's true of many other areas, but every decision we make in the food area, the food we buy, the food we grow, the food we feed our children, feed ourselves, is going to create a different food future for this country. It will either create one, as we're seeing now, of massive monocultures, of unspeakable cruelty to animals, of tremendous injustice for the people that work in it, uh, uh, unsustainable loss of topsoil, loss of diversity, monoculturing, so we've been losing 90 to 95% of our vegetable and fruit species, and patenting uh, of genetically engineered and, and genetically modified foods that go to two or three corporations who now own 50% of the world's commercial seeds. We don't want to head, that's where we're headed. We don't want to go there. So to choose every day against that, to choose organic, to choose organic and local, to choose organic and humane, to join a CSA, to become part of your community and your school's food choices, that is empowering. And that every choice you make will create, every one will help create, however small but important way, uh, the food future that is sustainable for us and uh, for the farm community, for the natural world. And, of course, I always – Remember those animals, those those billions of animals every year that are used for food. All right. Well, thank you for those the, those those comments. And uh, th- with respect to the relating the important, the, it sounds like their perspective that the most important component is the relationship with food. And it seems that uh, the most significant threat that we have now is are the items that you mentioned. And it, it sounds like the uh, from your perspective, at least, that the that the genetically modified food foods are one of the biggest threats that we have. Uh, would you agree uh, with that assessment? Absolutely. You know, um, you know, during my lifetime, you know, which is you know, post Second World War, uh, and uh, you know, we we uh, I grew up. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure some of your listeners are, are, are going to be able to relate to this. Is there's this? You know, I grew up with the Jetsons. I don't know if people remember the Jetsons, but they were sort of a, a space family, and they ate tablets. Uh, for their dinner with knife and fork, by the way, which I never completely understood. And then they they drank an orange drink, which at the time we assumed was Tang because that's what the astronauts were drinking or we were told they were drinking. So, I mean, that was there was a vision of food. If you go back to the 50s and 60s, uh, there was this vision of food in America that was going to be more and more industrialized, or, you know, more and more machinery used, more and more chemicals used, a completely artificial food and a system, which is going to be very profitable for the companies that made the machines and made the chemicals, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, and um, and that looked like where it was going to go uh, towards sort of a Jetsons future. But something happened on the way to that future they did not expect, and that was the entire organic movement, starting in Maine and California. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, there was also the enormously courageous Rachel Carson, who, said, who informed people about the dangers of, of pesticides in in their own lives and own health. And then uh, wonderful people like Cesar Chavez, who said, you know, you when you when you eat a grape, don't you you can't separate yourself from the life of the person that picked that grape. And so these are real heroes along the way, and so we developed this fantastic organic and now organic and beyond movement that is so exciting. Not just here, but I travel around the world everywhere. It's it's fantastic, and um, and it is the fastest growing sector in in American agriculture right now. And for the first time in the last two years, we have more farmers than we had the year before in the United States, and the vast majority of new farmers are organic, and the vast majority of them are women. So it's you know, we're seeing a, a, a slow but but real change in in what's going on. Massive growth, I said, in the organic movement. But the industrial folks have not given up. It's not as if they've threw their hands up and said, "Oh, we're going to give up on pesticides and give up on fertilizers and give up on toxic uh, additions to our food supply." Uh, they've gone even deeper, and that's when you get into genetic engineering, where they actually have said, "Let's alter the very genetic uh, basis of our food crops in order to make them more profitable." Uh, now, it turns out that it's, there's a lot more difficult than people thought, um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, for example, uh, folks may remember the Human Genome Project. We were supposed to have about 100 to 140,000 genes. Mm-hmm. We only have about 20,000 genes, it turns out, uh, and that's about as many as a worm. Uh, a kernel of corn has uh, – any cell in that kernel has uh, 35,000 genes. A Pinot Noir grape has 40,000 genes. Twice as many as we do. And they just did the, wien- uh, the genome of wheat, and it has 80,000 genes. So wheat has four times as many genes as humans. Four times. So it turns out that the biology of these crops isn't some simple thing, but extremely complex. And it turns out there's a huge amount we do not know. So this idea that you can take a little piece of DNA called a gene and switch it around between plants and animals and human and plants and bacteria and plants and get a predictable result to turn out not to be true. However, they were able to take some bacteria genes and put them in plants and, and, and make those plants immune from herbicides. That's about 80 to 85 percent of all of the genetically engineered crops in this country and around the world are designed to withstand herbicides. Now, every gardener and farmer out there knows if you spray your weed killer on your flower, what happens to the flowers? They die, right? Sure. And uh, But the chemical company said, hmm, it would be a lot more profitable for us if we could invent these crops where you can massively aerial spray or massively spray your herbicide on the crops, kill the weeds, but the crops stay alive. And that is what they've done for 80 to 85 percent. It's a neat little trick for them. And that is 80 to 85 percent of all the genetic engineered crops out there are herbicide tolerant, as they're called, or herbicide promoting. And most of those are made by Monsanto, whose herbicide is called Roundup. So that's where people have heard of Roundup Ready crops. That means these crops, you can spray as much Roundup on them as you want, and they won't die. And uh, there's a n- number of problems with that, including the fact that in the last two years, we've sprayed 153 million more pounds of herbicide on our crops because of the, the the corn and soy Roundup Ready crops and some cotton that are out there. But, of course, it's causing a number of problems, not simply the fact that we're poisoning more of our food and our land and our water, but we're also now seeing the growth of something called super weeds. There's so much Roundup out there that many weeds, including pigweed, which is a real problem uh, in the south, have, have we have 10 to 20 million acres now that have these these um, uh, uh, amazing weeds that you can't kill, you know. There and there's there there there's you know they have the thickness of a, a basket of, of a baseball bat and they're six or seven feet tall, and uh, so that's becoming a, a major problem. You know, Darwin rears his ugly head as as weeds adapt to this bath of Roundup that they're all getting, and then no longer can kill them. So right now, right now, uh, the FDA is looking to approve. 2,4-D, which is an element in Agent Orange crops, crops that are resistant to 2,4-D. I kid you not, Dow Chemical is doing this. Corn and soy that has been genetically engineered so you can spray as much 2,4-D, Agent Orange, on these crops and it won't kill them. Because now that Roundup is becoming less and less useful, 
uh, they're looking to uh, have new and new more toxic herbicides that they will now be bathing our crops in, uh, in in order to make money. And these are all chemical companies, Monsanto, Dow, DuPont. And then Monsanto is now coming up uh, with uh, dicamba, which is an extremely dangerous it's a volatilizing uh, herbicide. So in other words, you spray it under certain weather conditions, it will get go, go back up from the ground, re-volatize into a cloud, and it could go a mile or two away and come back down, and it will kill everything green. It's wow. It's very toxic, very toxic herbicide. So they're going up the toxic chain of herbicides, uh, making their money, the, the Monsantos, Dows, DuPonts, Syngentas, BASs of BS. PASFs of the world, and uh, and so this is a tremendous challenge to organic, uh, and to a uh, you know those of us who devoted our lives to trying to reduce the toxins in our food and our bodies. Now we see a technology which is specifically di- designed by the chemical companies to massively, and I mean massively, increase very very toxic chemicals in our food, in our environment. When you're talking 2,4-D, uh, Agent Orange, when you're talking um, Dicamba, you're talking very, very toxic material. So it, it represents a very real and present danger, uh, not only to organic, because it can contaminate organic, but also to each and every one of us. Well, I couldn't agree more, and thank you for that excellent summary of the current situation and where we're at. Uh, and I just want to reference back your Jetson analogy, and I, I did grow up watching that. I think it's one of the first color cartoons that were available uh, on a regular basis, at least uh, broadcast on TV. And, and you know, it seems to me philosophically it can be bo- broken down to a combination of two basic factors. One is this uh, literally a professional arrogance to think that we can – we're smarter than – all of our previous ancestors and can figure this thing out and 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 to hell with the consequences combined with the profit motivation of these major corporations that have been able to align themselves with the, or, or influence the government to allow their them to uh, achieve their corporate goals so it's that combination that just really gotten us into this giant mess but ultimately you know the people you mentioned that the organic movement was it was a result of this and i think it's just the common sense element of realizing that if we fail to follow the patterns of our ancestors, that uh, really uh, most of our genes, that you, the 20,000 genes you reference, are, are really based on because we can't change those genes over over decades. I mean, that occurs, but it occurs over hundreds, if not thousands of years. So we're sort of stuck with, with what our, with, uh, if we want to optimize our health, with seeking to replicate the, the environmental uh, variables that our ancestors were exposed to. And that certainly doesn't call for this dramatic and ras- massive revolution that's being proposed. So it, it's just common sense, it would seem, that we're going to have these massive consequences of, of pursuing.